Hello and welcome back to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We discuss anything and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. Now, recently you may have noticed that I did a two-part series about Dr. Phil and his show and his lack of licensing and all that good stuff. And many of you noted, why did I leave out Dr. Phil's ranch? Well, that was done intentionally because today's episode is all about Dr. Phil's ranch. In fact, there's so many problems with it that it really did deserve its own episode. Now, of course, where a lot of these teens were sent to Turnabout Ranch is alleged abuse. So we're gonna be talking about some really serious and heavy topics here. If you are not prepared to hear that, I'm just letting you know in advance because that is exactly what today is going to be covering. And a lot of these allegations are still really recent. So even as this goes live, there's probably gonna be more information out there. So I apologize that I did not catch everything and I probably won't be able to, but I'm happy that this is at least coming out. Better late than never. And that's where we are. I think it's important to bring attention to this. So let's get right into it. Now, almost immediately when looking up Turnabout Ranch's origins, I'm reminded of Tranquility Bay a lot. Now, in that situation, Tranquility Bay was one school of many that operated under a large umbrella company called Wasps or Wasp, depending on how you like it phrased. And don't worry, I am going through the schools and I will get to the giant umbrella company itself too, because there's quite a few interesting details in that as well. Now here, at least initially, Turnabout Ranch looks no different. We're a minute or two in, and I already feel very doubtful that these children and their safety was ever a priority here. So before we talk about the ranch specifically, let's talk about this umbrella company for a moment because this one's different from Wasps. This one's called the Aspen Education Group. So let's get into them. Aspen was founded in 1997 and it's said to be a spin-off of College Health Enterprises, a privately held healthcare management company founded in 86. Aspen grew fairly quickly. They began buying up other programs that could cost $400 a day for parents to send their teenagers to those locations. In 2002, the company received a $15 million investment and a $48 million loan. They were a money-making machine. Around 2005, they also, quote, expanded into the obesity market, offering schools and camps for overweight teenagers, end quote. Now, something about that wording does rub me the wrong way, but something about the entire article does too. I'm not saying the New York Times did a poor job of reporting the facts here, but the whole thing seems to turn these teenagers very real struggles into just dollar signs. I understand the doctors, therapists, counselors, and other workers at this facility need to be paid. I get why it could be costly, but the whole we're expanding our market wording just feels like Aspen said, we just need to make more money as opposed to we want to help more kids. It doesn't really help that according to this article, a reality TV show on ABC was released around this time called Brat Camp, which shows a wilderness program for teens in action. Brat Camp, really? If the Tranquility Bay and other scripts about this topic have taught me anything, it's that a lot of the teenagers in these programs are lashing out or having troubles because they've been abused, gone through some trauma, or they may have mental illnesses. So calling them brats is extremely dismissive. I get it's the title of a reality TV show and you need to get your clicks and whatever, but at the same time, I just think we had come a long way with mental health awareness since 2005 and even still we have a long way to go. But the fact that these kinds of camps were condoning this language says a lot about them, not the so-called brats they were attending to. Also as sort of an aside here, CRC Health Group with the support of the venture capital firm Bain Capital acquired Aspen in 2006. For a little while, Aspen was known as the CRC Youth Division. So if you've ever heard of CRC Youth, it's essentially the same thing. Now, I don't wanna stray too far from this particular topic and start talking about a venture capital firm. So let's just stick to Aspen and the programs it controlled for now. Anyway, the cracks began to show in the early 2010s and Aspen began closing programs left and right. At one point, Aspen stated, the need for residential treatment for teens with behavioral or substance issues may arguably be as big, if not bigger than it ever was. 
However, changing market dynamics, including the inability of families to obtain credit, loans, or home equity lines to help finance treatment have made it difficult for parents to access treatment. It has become abundantly clear that the current market does not support us maintaining our entire network of therapeutic programs. Considering the legacy of these quality programs, this was not an easy decision. It comes after extensive financial investment in the clinical care, infrastructure, and marketing of these programs, and following serious deliberation about the current therapeutic education market and how we can best continue to serve all of our valued families and professionals with an outstanding ongoing network. The market crash in 2008 hit a lot of people hard, and perhaps in part of it, parents simply couldn't afford to send their kids to Aspen. After all, these closures began in 2009, then sort of continued steadily afterwards. Financial reasons certainly could have played a larger role in this. However, there were more than just monetary issues at play here too. One of the facilities called Mount Bachelor Academy was shut down in late 2009 due to allegations of abuse. According to a November 2009 article, the State Department of Human Services told parents to remove their children from the school last week after a seven month investigation concluded that students were subject to inappropriate sexual role play, public humiliation, and physical deprivation. The state gave the academy 90 days to correct a list of violations, said DHS spokesman Gene Evans, but has not heard anything since. The school's parent company, California-based Aspen Education Group, announced the permanent closure Monday in a Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act to the state's Department of Community Colleges and Workforce Development. In the notice, Mark Dorenfeld, senior vice president for Aspen Education, states that the company is unable to provide 60 days notice as required by the federal act because the closing is the result of an unforeseeable business circumstance, namely the revocation of the facility's operating license. Again, Dorenfeld may not be wrong. Finances and business circumstances could have played a role here, but DHS spokesperson Evans stated that the school's license was only temporarily suspended, and if they took corrective action, it would be reinstated. In other words, Aspen decided they'd rather shut down one of their facilities than address the abuse happening inside, then blame it on the state for revoking their license. Charming. It says a lot about Aspen. If there were a teacher or facilitator being inappropriate and the school took immediate action and recognized, then I'd be saying something different. But instead, Aspen completely ignored the problem and by extension, the teenagers that were entrusted to their care. One source claims that a school known as New Leaf, a private boarding school for girls, was essentially kicking out their students and disrupting their lives in favor of enrolling those with autism simply because they believed they could make more money that way. Unsurprisingly, there's allegations of abuse there too. The Talisman Academy, as it was called, was an academic program for grades seven to 12 for students on the autistic spectrum. It was closed at the end of the summer 2013, and there's an entire webpage on healonline.org dedicated for survivors telling their story of this place. Although Heal is still gathering information on Talisman, they've released what information they have about New Leaf, and it's really worrying to say the least. According to Heal, parents are required by New Leaf Academy to sign over custody of their children to the program for a minimum of 18 to 24 months. Since New Leaf Academy takes children under the age of 10 years, this required separation from community and family appears to be excessive and cruel. New Leaf Academy requires a minimum stay of 18 months and states they will not release your child unless it's on the program's terms or the child reaches the age of majority. Another issue that arises is that New Leaf Academy refers to discharge papers as opposed to a graduation slash diploma papers. In using a medical term discharge to describe what they claim is a primary education slash academic achievement, it is seemingly intending to imply a medical slash mental health service or program. Since New Leaf Academy is not a licensed medical or mental health facility, this again creates an impression of deceptive marketing practices. Any mental health service provided by a qualified psychiatrist, psychologist, or other healthcare professional is billed separately to the parents or their insurance carriers. Mental health services performed by unqualified doctors or unlicensed personnel at New Leaf Academy is implied, including in the overly expensive monthly tuition costs. It seems New Leaf would be using some of the extravagant expenses charged as tuition to cover basic licensed therapists or professionals since it claims to be a therapeutic program. So these additional charges raise a concern regarding the legitimacy of the high tuition costs applied to parents or their insurance carriers. And just like WASPs, they also encourage the kidnappings that we've talked about before, where parents hire people to come take their child away in the middle of the night without warning. Their mental health professionals are subcontractors, which means that if a child is abused, misdiagnosed, drugged, or confined in isolation, New Leaf isn't responsible. They say it's the subcontractor's fault and they're not liable, even though they're the ones hiring these people. 
Their contract calls for permission to use a student's record and assessments for research. They require unquestioning and full cooperation. They refuse responsibility for harm arising in these kidnappings. They provide and endorse. Their pediatrician is a subcontractor and they're not responsible for his actions either. It's an absolute mess. The contract, by the way, it's 12 pages long and it's not like Aspen has a couple problems or questionable methods. Pretty much everything they do is questionable. As worrying as their contracts might be, some of the resulting abuse that's happened at these Aspen camps is absolutely sickening, according to one source. An employee at the Bromley Brook School who one student told police was a coach and a teacher had been charged with two felonies after police said he kissed a 12-year-old student several times and had a sexual relationship with a 16-year-old student. Stephen F. Peters, 40 of Woodford, was arraigned in Bennington District Court on December 2nd on felony counts of sexual exploitation of a minor and lewd and lascivious conduct with a child. Peters pleaded not guilty to both charges. In a statement, Bromley Brook School Executive Director David Hahn said the staff at the school could not discuss specifics about staff members or students because of federal privacy laws. Upon hearing the alleged incident, we took immediate action and contacted the appropriate agencies, including the Vermont Department for Children and Families, Family Services Division, and subsequently the Manchester Police Department, and have fully cooperated with these agencies in their investigation. In addition, we immediately notified the parents of each of our students and continue to work closely with the parental guardians of the involved students, Hans said in the statement. The school claimed they did conduct a background check on Peters. However, given that students have been sexualized multiple times at these schools and even asked to reenact past trauma such as rape, it's kind of hard for me to give Aspen the benefit of the doubt. Tragically, it does get worse and much worse. One woman, Crystal Manganaro, stepped forward and stated that her son, Matthew, died as a result of the lack of training, compassion, and effort on Aspen's part. Aspen owned a therapeutic wilderness camp called Lone Star Expeditions that agreed to take Matthew for one month. Now, before anyone comments that, oh, Crystal was a horrible mother for sending him here and hiring kidnappers to take him to this program, let me just say that for Crystal, at least from the tone of her message, wanted Matthew to get help. He was making threats of violence against others and he had even been hospitalized for suicidal tendencies at a very young age, in fourth grade, she says. Crystal also didn't actually hire these glorified kidnappers that many other parents do. Matthew was well aware of where he was going. He just asked how long he would be there. Crystal told her son that the minimum was 28 days, depending on how well he did. And she said she loved him very much, hugged him, and Matthew left for Aspen. According to Crystal, this is what happened. Matthew was on medication for bipolar disorder. At home, every night was a fight to get him to take the medication only because he fought anything I asked him to do. I'm telling you this because Matthew refused his medication at the camp. They were to call me and his doctor if he refused any medication. I never got a phone call and neither did his doctor. Well, his doctor did get a phone call the day after Matt died. Matthew suffered for over 24 hours in excruciating pain. The night before he died, September 16th, he complained of his chest hurting. He was mumbling and stumbling around and his legs felt numb. The field instructors called a psychologist and over the phone, he decided it was just an anxiety attack and to not worry about it. On September 17th, nine days after he entered the program, Matt's group was on a one mile hike and they got lost. So the hike ended up being more than three miles with the heat index between 115 and 130 degrees Fahrenheit. When they stopped for lunch, Matthew said he couldn't go on any further. The staff said they had to make it to the evening camp and to move it. He just couldn't move and the other boys offered to carry him. The peer pressure must have been tough because Matthew finally struggled and moved. When they got close to the evening camp after many stops for Matt to rest, Matt was really struggling, especially the last 200 yards. There were only five boys and two field instructors. Someone should have been able to physically go and check out Matthew. One of the instructors personally told me to my face that he was an ex Navy SEAL and that Matthew was the first person he had ever lost doing CPR. This person was never in the Navy, but Aspen Education Group apparently didn't do a background check. Everyone he worked with thought he was ex Navy. How can that happen? Crystal ended up hiring a lawyer to dig deeper and what she learned was horrific to say the least. Matt was made to carry on despite the extreme heat and one of the field instructors confessed to throwing water over Matt and telling him he was faking. Apparently in the state of Texas, residential treatment centers are not required to have a registered nurse on staff unless there are 25 or more kids on hand. Because Matt was in a group of eight boys that day, there were no medical professionals nearby when he needed one the most. The only one that was called was the night before and they just diagnosed him over the phone. So clearly that shows what lengths this camp went to to protect their children in their care. And that's less than the bare minimum. 
You'd think that Aspen would learn from this, that this tragedy would make them wake up a little bit, but it didn't. Five years later, yet another student died from the exact same thing, heat stroke, at one of their program walks. I wish I was joking, but according to the Community Alliance for the Ethical Treatment of Youth, the Lake County Sheriff's Office has concluded its primary investigation into the death of Sergei Balishtin in North Lake County on August 28, 2009. Sergey was attending Sage Walk, the wilderness school, when he died participating in his first program hike. Findings, investigative opinions, and recommendations have been prepared in a criminal investigations report. They add that this was the school known for being featured on the program Brat Boot Camp and say, the investigation into the death of a 16 year old Portland boy who collapsed on a hike with a Redmond based wilderness school this summer is focusing on reports that the boy may not have had proper nutrition and medical care before and during his hike through a remote area of Northern Lake County. In an affidavit requesting a search warrant to seek documents and other evidence from Sagewalk Wilderness School's Southwestern Obsidian Avenue office last month, Lake County Sheriff's Deputy Chuck Poré wrote that he believes Sergey's death was a homicide and the result of criminal mistreatment and reckless endangerment by the school. Sergey wasn't given proper nutrition. He even wrote poems about his hunger that day. One read, squirrels running around, blue skies, green bushes and trees, but I'm still hungry. Knowing that he died that day, it breaks my heart to know that's one of the last words he ever wrote. Sergey was carrying food, water, and clothing in a pack that weighed between 40 and 50 pounds. Sergey vomited, but the hike continued. Shortly afterwards, he collapsed, lying on his back, declined food, hyperventilated, and his breathing stopped. When Sergey stopped breathing, they called the school nurse, not 911. By the time 911 did arrive, it was 45 minutes later and Sergey was long gone. The sheriff's deputy Poré wrote, "'Never before have I encountered a body that was warmer than my own touch, and it was especially remarkable as it was overcast and had been hours since death. Although I was gloved, I was wearing short sleeves and I could feel the heat radiation against my own skin. My senses likened the feeling to touching someone who had just gotten out of a hot shower. This case was settled out of court for an undisclosed amount, making the second student to die from a heat stroke under an Aspen program's care. And yet, though I think we can all agree by now that Aspen should not be trusted, here's where Dr. Phil enters the picture because he still sends people to their programs. Now, even though I feel that I have barely skimmed the surface on Aspen and we've only looked into just a handful of the schools they've been involved in and some of the worst cases I could find, I'm not saying that every single camp for kids is horrific, abusive, and is going to make someone worse off. I'm sure there's a few good ones out there, even though it doesn't exactly feel that way based on everything I continue to find, and especially not after reading everything I've already read. If a camp is owned by Aspen, I would just never send a child there. Plain and simple, their rules and contracts are messed up, the way they treat people is fucked up, and the way Sergey died is beyond, just, just beyond anything. Now, the fact that Dr. Phil would still send a child in need of help to any of these camps under this umbrella makes me question who he is as a supposed professional and frankly, as a human being with any compassion whatsoever. And now it's time to take a quick break and thank today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Make sure you skip those trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make your home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal delivery kit. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery trips to the store so that you can just get home and enjoy cooking and eat the delicious food, obviously. And you can even try meals ready in 20 minutes or less, lightning prep recipes, and quick breakfasts and lunches, perfect for your busy schedule. And HelloFresh offers over 25 meal options every single week. And there's something for everyone to enjoy with all recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutrition experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. And you get better value too. HelloFresh is 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store and 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal without sacrificing quality, according to a Zagat dining survey. So if you wanna get started with HelloFresh today, make sure to go to hellofresh.com slash casket12 and use code casket12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Again, make sure to go to hellofresh.com slash casket12 and use code casket12, 12 free meals, including free shipping. Thank you for sponsoring today's Corporate Casket. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes of today's episode, which is the Turnabout Ranch specifically. And this is where Dr. Phil's involvement comes into direct play with Aspen. 
onto the ranch, more specifically, Turnabout Ranch. According to their website, they're a year-round school that accepts students ages 13 to 17. They recommend finding a professional transport service right on their admissions page, though they also claim to have a commitment to excellence. I've got a lot of issues with these transport services, namely the fact that I feel the traumatic experience does more harm than good here. I get convincing your child to go would be difficult for some parents, but I don't think dragging them off without a word in the middle of the night is a solution to that problem either. Now, Dr. Phil's testimony is on the philosophy page of Turnabout Ranch, and here's what it says. If there are programs in this country that I have seen work what I call absolute miracles, it would be Turnabout Ranch. It's a real working ranch where real values are taught, such as accountability and being able to trust yourself and create values. His show vouches for Turnabout Ranch often. Danielle Brigoli is one of the most famous people that's attended the ranch, now known for her rapper name Bad Baby, and she's spoken out against the ranch fairly recently. She explains in her videos exactly what we've heard about with Tranquility Bay and these facilities before. Even though at a glance, you might think Turnabout Ranch is for kids that have committed crimes, sometimes the students there are kids lashing out because of trauma and sexual abuse they've endured, in which case they need real help, licensed therapists, someone trustworthy to talk to, not someone subcontracted from Aspen that maybe knows how to do their job. Danielle also makes the point that extreme physical labor isn't actually helping kids that need it. Picking up massive stacks of hay isn't going to lessen someone's abuse, trauma, mental illness, etc. Danielle's spoken out a lot more in recent days too, that this story is getting more attention and lawsuits are being filed. She said she was malnourished, abused, and came back with more trauma than I went there with. We'll get into what things look like for the ranch today, but for now, let's slowly work our way into it. I won't pretend that I know what's best for kids that are going through these kinds of traumatic events because I truly don't. For some, maybe some time away and outdoors really does help. For others, maybe it's as simple as therapy. I'm sure that it's different for every single kid that goes there. And I'm sure the intentions and treatment varies between facilities too. Their reviews on Yelp, for example, are 2.5 out of five stars. And to me, that says they help just as much as they hurt. Some parents say their daughter found herself again. Others claim the staff is racist. One former attendee says they made all the difference to her, while others say the instructors are abusive, maniacal, and it's not better than child labor. Frankly, there's actually a lot more negative than positive remarks here, simply because you can't give zero stars. Even if Turnabout Ranch does help a few teenagers here and there, by most accounts, they're doing much more harm and damage than I think they're helping anyone. So let's get deeper into why that is, aside from being under the Aspen umbrella. What happened at Turnabout Ranch specifically? The first major signs of abuse at Turnabout Ranch came along in 2012. I'm not saying they were a fantastic place up until then, but this is when the first lawsuits against Turnabout specifically came along. Unfortunately, the case was dismissed due to the statute of limitations being reached. I don't know if the legal process dragged along there and that's why it surpassed the deadline. Maybe the victim took some time to come forward. I can't say for sure. So please keep in mind that this particular case we're going to look at is alleged. This has not been confirmed. So according to the lawsuit, Julia Verney signed an enrollment agreement with Turnabout Ranch to take full and complete custody of her daughter, Elizabeth Verney. This was all the way back in 2004 that this agreement took place and it anticipated she'd stay at least 80 days at the cost of $310 a day. After the initial 80 days when Turnabout Ranch had full custody, Julia went to the ranch to visit her daughter. She was terrified, subdued, her hands were raw, continuously bleeding, she lost weight and she appeared exhausted. They took her out of the ranch for an hour for a visit, and she was paranoid that their conversation would be reported to the ranch. According to Julia, she feared retribution for anything she did, said, or thought that was not ranch approved. When they wanted to remove Elizabeth, Max Stewart, the executive director, threatened to withhold her passport. Let me reiterate, this is alleged. Also, while the lawsuit names Max Stewart as the person they spoke to, my other source says it was a Max Stewart that was the executive director. I don't know if there's a Max Stewart or a Max Stewart on the same ranch, but just in case, I'll say they talked to a guy named Max who basically told the parents they couldn't remove her. According to these court documents, the ranch functioned by lying to the parents about the child's false progress and to the child about her parents' approval of the treatment she received. Many of the parents' letters were never given to Elizabeth and her letters to them were censored. Most of Elizabeth's daily letters never reached her parents. The ranch told Elizabeth that her parents had indeed phoned the camp regularly and agreed with the camp's criticisms of Elizabeth and did not want her to return home. 
Elizabeth asked her psychiatrist to tell her parents how unhappy and afraid she was and that she wanted to come home or speak to them directly. To the contrary, her parents were told only that Elizabeth was happy and wanted to stay at the camp even beyond her 80 day program. The lawsuit also states that one of the reasons this case may have taken so long to be filed is because Elizabeth's parents are British citizens. They didn't know the differences between the laws in Utah where she was sent to the UK where they were based. You get the picture. It's a whole mess trying to figure out how to deal with a lawsuit in another country. The court documents also read, during her stay, Elizabeth was subjected to sleep deprivation, denied food, and yet forced to eat and prepare meat, which was abhorrent to her as a vegetarian. The ranch threatened her with restraint and force feeding with a tube if she did not comply. The ranch forced physical labor and excessive exercise in extreme temperatures. It forced her regularly to put her hands in a sink filled with bleach to wash dishes until they bled, leaving to this day scars on her knuckles. Staff's verbal abuse was unrelenting, humiliating, both in private and in group denunciation meetings where she was made to list her faults and listen to her peers taking turns denigrating her and her faults and what they disliked about her, not as therapy, but out of relish. Staff regularly threatened Elizabeth with physical violence, including potential suffocation if she tried to run away. They told her daily that she was a bad person and described her as disgusting, stupid, manipulative, pathetic, and bad. They screamed at her, punished her for crying and for having panic attacks that caused fearful hyperventilation. We talk about these denunciation meetings and how unfortunately common they are in these types of programs for teenagers. Synanon is widely credited with starting them, though that's an entirely separate video that is coming soon. The point of all this is, if true, it's disgusting. There's no excuse for it. There's no reason or justification for it. And this doesn't help anyone. I can't say that all of this is 100% accurate again because it's alleged, but it all rings true to me. This sounds a lot like the abuse we've heard about in many other camps before. There's similar allegations, the excessive exercise we know Aspen is known for. So I do believe Elizabeth. You can take or leave this, but I found it worth mentioning. There are allegations that date this far back to me, which says Aspen didn't simply get worse. They've always had this disturbing pattern of behavior. Salon also did an investigative piece about Aspen around the same time in 2012. And again, though none of this has been confirmed, they said there were claims about the sexual assault of a female student by an Aspen employee at Turnabout Ranch. Their story reads, the girl was later duct taped and restrained by staff. A former employee, Tony Thayer, told Feldman after writing complaints about abusive staff conduct to management, state regulators, and Garfield County Sheriff in 2004, but no sanctions followed. Though this, as well as what Elizabeth said, may only be allegations. It is a clear pattern of misbehavior that's starting to emerge and one against Aspen is already present. However, because of the torture and abuse endured by these students, it's not only their lives that are in danger. Years later in 2016, one teenager actually killed a staff member to escape the torture they were enduring. The Washington Post in 2016 claims that the Arizona teen 17 woke up in his cabin with another resident and stepped outside to start their chores, Perkins told the Deseret News in an extensive interview. In the area known as the Circle, the teens built a fire and prepared breakfast. As a brief aside here, the Deseret News is owned by the LDS church and they're not an entirely reputable source considering that there's a bunch of obvious bias going on here. That's been brought to my attention before, but since there was an exclusive interview with the Deseret for this case, you might see it mentioned here. So I just wanted to point that out, but let's continue. An hour later at 7.30 AM, staffer James Jimmy Woosley, 61, stopped to check on them. It was then that the Arizona teen, for reasons unknown to authorities, pulled out a hidden weapon. He hit Woosley on the back of the head, Perkins told the Deseret News, and when the 61-year-old man fell to the ground, the teen hit him again and again. It was brutal, vicious, violent, very violent attack, the sheriff told the newspaper. Woosley was later transported to a local hospital where he died from blunt force trauma to the head. The sheriff told Deseret News that it didn't appear the fatal attack was spawned by a personal vendetta. The Arizona teen had even spoken very highly of Woosley, according to Perkins, who said the turnabout staffer was a jovial, easygoing guy who had worked at the ranch for a decade and loved to hunt and fish. He was just simply unhappy to be there and he wanted to leave, Perkins said of the teen, according to the Deseret News. Why he did what he did, I don't know. After he allegedly beat Woosley, Perkins told the Deseret News, the Arizona teen took the man's keys, but couldn't get the car to start. 
The 17 year old turned toward a cabin where the other resident from the circle had fled for safety. Inside was a female staffer identified as Alicia Keller in the Salt Lake Tribune and four other residents. The Arizona teen turned his weapon on Keller, the sheriff said, beating her in the head and a hand and threatening to kill her if she didn't relinquish her car keys. Keller tossed them on the sidewalk, according to the Tribune, then led other teens into the nearby woods to safely wait for law enforcement. What happened to Woosley is tragic. I don't know if he took part in the abuse or not. So I don't wanna speculate if the teenager was being abused by Woosley himself or simply saw getting past Woosley as a way to escape. My sources have said that he didn't intend to kill anyone, but he just wanted to get away. And again, with so little information being released about this teenager, I just can't say for sure what happened here. However, what amazes me about this case is the fact that this happened years ago, back in 2016, and I don't see any consequences for Turnabout Ranch itself. If a teenager was this desperate to escape, why wouldn't law enforcement at least glance at the Turnabout Ranch and question, hey, how are they treating these kids? Was this a case of a violent teenager lashing out or was it a case of someone pushed to their absolute breaking point? I'm not going to say the murder was justified by any means. I just wish that a more thorough investigation was actually done. For now, let's get into the more modern allegations. Thanks to the Paris Hilton documentary and a spotlight finally being shown on these abusive schools, more people have been coming forward and speaking out. Hell, many of you have personally reached out and emailed me and shared your stories of the specific schools that I've covered that either you were involved in, your friends were involved in, or nearby family or sister schools that you went to. So I know there's many of you out there that felt an extreme amount of pain from being at these schools. And for some of you, your stories may never be told. So hopefully these spotlights at these certain schools and that more people are speaking out gives some sort of resolution or peace to what may have happened back then. One Colorado woman, Hannah Archuleta said, the documentary from Paris Hilton inspired her to come forward with her story of sexual abuse. According to Hannah, she was 17 when she was at Turnabout Ranch and a staff member grabbed her butt and genital area. She eventually confided in female staff members, hoping they would stop the abuse. Instead, I experienced retaliation from the ranch after I spoke up, she said. In what appeared to me to be punishment for reporting my abuse, I was required to spend extra time picking up horse manure, walking in circles around a horse corral and sitting at a desk facing a wall for hours. I also had to do forced labor outside in below freezing temperatures and sleep on a wooden plank with no pillow. Archuleta is now suing Turnabout Ranch, alleging the facility was negligent in hiring the male staffer who assaulted her and intentionally inflicted emotional distress on her. She is represented by Gloria Allred, a well-known women's rights attorney who represented women who say they were abused by famous men like Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein. First of all, I seriously commend Hannah for speaking out. I know that can't be easy to talk about. Secondly, they punished her for telling them about abuse. Apparently the sheriff's department didn't act either. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised that they seemingly did so little work investigating when it came to Woosley. The widow of Woosley is also bringing a lawsuit against the school because according to her, the 17 year old that killed her husband should have never been there. Now that this teenager is an adult, more information has been released about what happened that day. And as the Salt Lake Tribune published, the ranch admittance standards outlined in the lawsuit, in addition to the ranch's website, say it doesn't allow in individuals who demonstrate aggressive behavior or have active suicide attempts among other behaviors. The lawsuit also states the program was not geared to deal with minors suffering from serious drug addictions and certainly not minors going through drug withdrawal. Despite this, the lawsuit says the ranch took in Brewer who had a history of suicide attempts and was addicted to prescription pills. During his short stay at the ranch, Brewer tried to kill himself by drinking bleach. On his fifth day there, he killed Jimmy Woosley and severely injured Keller. He absolutely should not have been at that ranch. I'm not saying Brewer did not deserve help, simply that Turnabout Ranch wasn't equipped to handle him. Brewer needed professional help. And as if I've learned anything this far, it's that Aspen facilities can't provide professional help. As for Dr. Phil, I understand that celebrities are people. However, people make mistakes and maybe back the wrong company from time to time. It happens. However, even the most basic research into this company yields these types of results. There's times when I have to seriously dig to find any dirt on an organization, but even on Aspen's Wikipedia page, a basic rundown of these allegations are easily available and accessible. There's no excuse whatsoever for Dr. Phil's continued pattern of sending teenagers to these types of camps. Maybe he'll stop, maybe he'll issue a statement, but as of writing this, there's no apology or explanation from him or his team. 
Now, even though I'm not exactly a fan of Danielle Brigoli, I commend her for using her platform to bring forward this type of attention. It does not invalidate her experience in any way, despite the fact I don't like who she is as a social media personality. This is important to bring forward and I feel horrible for what she may have gone through. She helped validate Hannah's words with her own story, brought more eyes onto the allegations. So I'm glad for that. Hopefully this simply doesn't fade into the background because unfortunately, this isn't the first time Dr. Phil has been in hot water for sending a teenager to a camp that's known for abuse either. Another one of these camps is called Island View Residential Treatment Center. When Dr. Phil had a 15 year old teenager, Sierra Myers on his show in 2013, he believed Island View was the right fit for her. She claimed to be meeting up with strange men for sex and that she'd even witnessed a murder. Dr. Phil felt her stories were not credible, calling her out and lying, and as some would say, ridiculed her publicly. One source states, in their February 2013 Dr. Phil episode, McGraw told Terry Myers that she had failed her daughter by a country mile and he accused the daughter of total naivety. Based on McGraw's assessment of the situation, SM was offered help in a treatment center. The complaint states, Dr. Phil's psychological remedy was to offer free treatment for the daughter at Island View, a Utah punitive behavior modification lockdown facility. Dr. Phil, however, knew or should have known that any placement at Island View would subject SM to such demented regimens that she would be at risk of her problems being exacerbated. McGraw, the Myers say, never addressed the trauma this young woman had already suffered by having the 19 year old that she and an equally young female friend had just had sex with shot to death in front of them by the molester's friend, a jealous teenage male. Dr. Phil thus ignored the causes of SM's trauma and then exacerbated that trauma by paying Island View to lock her up far from home in a private prison. Whether or not she did witness a murder, I can't say for sure. Dr. Phil doubted the story, but I wasn't there. I don't have police records, so I don't have a clue. And hey, some of you might think Dr. Phil gives his guests some tough love. Some may say he's a bully. Since that argument is a bit more subjective, let's get into that part that isn't and how she was treated at the camp. Whether or not you think a teenager deserves to be torn apart on national television, I'd say not. Hopefully we can all agree here that they should never be subjected to the serious abuse that we've seen come out of these Aspen facilities. My source states that Sierra Myers was subjected to cruel punishment, including a broken arm. When a math teacher, Ryan Mortison, told her to stay after school, she refused and went to her room. He then came after her and ordered her to an isolation room for timeout. She refused that too in emphatic and obscene language and told him to leave her alone. He then pulled her off her bed and called for help for three others to enforce his command. In the melee that ensued, there was a loud pop that stopped everyone in their tracks. SM's right dominant arm was badly and perhaps irreparably broken and its main nerve severely damaged. Given the rapes and murders she had been through, the last thing any untrained male should have done was assault her. Was Sierra being difficult and not listening? Sure, maybe. Does that give anyone a right to assault her and break her arm? No. This is a behavioral center for teenagers going through trauma. What the hell was this teacher expecting? It takes a special kind of patient person to work with kids that are struggling in this way and these teachers shouldn't be there. Hell, the school shouldn't be hiring people if they're not willing to train them and explain the difficulties of this job. Dr. Phil said that he had no influence over the girl's treatment, but he was the one who recommended Island View in the first place. I'm not saying he's the one that broke her arm, obviously, but Dr. Phil's the one that's constantly sending teenagers to these Aspen hell holes. So of course he does deserve some criticism for it. Now, as far as I can tell, the lawsuit and complaints against Dr. Phil did unfortunately fail with a note stating a plaintiff alleging fraud must know what his claim is when he files it. Sierra's parents may not have succeeded in their lawsuit, but I'm hoping Hannah does. Considering that she has a powerful lawyer on her side, maybe we'll see some results and some justice this time around. All in all, I'm not entirely surprised that Dr. Phil would send the teenager on his show to irreputable treatment facilities. I just genuinely didn't expect them to be quite this terrible. There's debate about effectiveness of the programs as well, since studies of almost a thousand students claim their facilities are legitimate. However, these studies are, well, funded by Aspen themselves and are without a control group. So take, uh, take away what you want from that. 
START, or the Alliance for the Safe, Therapeutic, and Appropriate Use of Residential Treatment, took a look at a couple studies widely used to support these treatment centers, and they stated, "'There is a dearth of research on the effectiveness of residential programs, and this study provides some information for consideration. However, there are striking conflicts of interest in the research and several flaws within the methodology of the study that make its findings questionable. Further, industry websites make claims about their findings and the meaning that go far beyond what the data show and that our experts believe are misleading to parents, providers, and youth. This study was funded by a company that owns and operates for-profit residential programs and specifically the programs in this study, which is a conflict of interest. The company also uses the study's researcher to personally recruit customers for the programs, which clearly draws her objectivity into question. Further, Aspen appears to cherry pick the results that support their industry and programs and makes claims about the causes of change in children's health that are not justified by this data. I'm not saying that this means Aspen fails every person, just that there isn't enough evidence to prove they work in the first place. So sure, while the prices may be ridiculously high and their marketing tactics may also have been called into question, today I really wanted to focus on the absolutely despicable evidence of abuse that occurs at these types of camps, ones which Dr. Phil has endorsed. There have been two deaths of heat stroke on Aspen's watch and a guard killed by a teenager that very clearly needed more help than they could provide. There are many, many allegations of verbal, sexual, and physical abuse, and all of this could be easily found in the years while Dr. Phil was recommending them. He's called them miracle workers, and frankly, I'd like to see him look at the survivors of these camps, as well as the parents of those that didn't survive, and try to justify that statement. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you were able to learn something new today, although an unpleasant topic, I do hope you were able to take something away from this. Thank you so much for making it to another corporate casket. I love you guys and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.